Hello, and welcome to the History of Philosophy in India by Janardan Ganari and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Case Worker, Panani's Grammar. The power wielded by the Brahmins of ancient India stemmed not from armies or wealth, but from knowledge. That power was duly expressed not in wars or lavish building projects, but in words and ritual deeds, the sacrifice of animals and plants, the uttering of chants and formulas. It's a testament to the intimate relation between Brahmanic authority and language that they produced some of the world's oldest literature. That literature frequently refers to language, especially spoken language. Remember that the Vedas and Upanishads were transmitted orally for many generations before being written down. Speech is duly a running theme in the Upanishads, as when the self is said to consist of speech, mind, and breath, or the purifying sacrifice to be enacted through two things, mind and speech. The ritual can succeed only when both are correct, as a cart cannot roll on only one wheel. No wonder, then, that ancient India was also home to one of the most impressive feats in the history of linguistics, the grammar of Panani. As so often, his dates are uncertain, but he seems to have lived from the 6th to the 5th centuries BC. His fame rests upon the Ashtadhyayi, or Book in Eight Chapters, a dense and technical work describing the grammatical structure of Sanskrit by means of thousands of aphoristic remarks. It's an astounding achievement, even if it draws on the work of earlier grammarians. The composition and subsequent reception of the eight chapters and other texts ascribed to Panini illustrate more general features of the Indian literary tradition. For one thing, the whole endeavor presupposes a religious context. It is the sacredness of the Sanskrit language that makes it worth analyzing in such minute detail, and the most obvious precursor to Panani's grammar can be found in works that discuss Vedic verses on a word-by-word -word basis. But you don't have to be a historian of religion to appreciate the results. Indeed, most of the scholarship devoted to Panani is by specialists in linguistics, and says nothing at all about his cultural or religious setting. Instead, he is taken seriously as a figure whose ideas can be compared with those of modern-day linguists like Noam Chomsky. For another thing, the reception of Panini's work followed a pattern we'll be seeing often in the episodes to come. Like the philosophers of the various schools, the Paninian grammarians produce layers of commentary on their authoritative source text, which in their case was the eight chapters. The aphorisms in which he set down his grammar were called sutras, brief remarks that had to be memorized and passed on orally. Later grammarians added comments called vartika, intended to supplement panani, for instance by making additional points deemed to be absent in the original sutras. There was also the detailed form of exegesis known as bhashya, which unfolded the teaching and often added illustrative examples. The most important such text in the grammatical tradition was the Mahabhashya of Patanjali, written in the 2nd century BC. Generally speaking, such exegesis was intended to explain and expand on the founder's remarks, but it was also possible in a bhashya to challenge or correct those remarks. Patanjali confirms the point we were just making about the religious imperative of Panani's grammar, since he writes at the beginning of his commentary that grammar should be studied for the sake of the preservation of the Vedas. Yet Panani's grammar is no Vedic commentary, but a study of the entire Sanskrit language. The grammarians do not necessarily analyze Vedic verses, but devote their attention to quotidian examples of language like Devadatta is cooking rice. Why should the philosopher care about any of it, though? Not in hopes of finding a vision of the universe and its relation to the individual, as in the Upanishads, Instead, their grammar constitutes a reflection on the structure, and implicitly the nature, of language. Patanjali says that grammar offers instruction about words, but of course it isn't the sort of instruction that children receive from their parents when they are learning to talk, or for that matter, the sort that you'd receive if you took a class on Sanskrit. 
Their grammar does explain the formation of individual words, but obviously it cannot proceed by considering each well-formed word individually. That would be a never-ending task, as captured in the nice story that the god Brihaspati taught our patient friend Indra about language for 1,000 years one word at a time, by which point they still hadn't finished the subject. Instead, grammar must deploy generalization and abstraction. One of Panini's most important breakthroughs is to use stand-in abbreviations to represent a range of possible cases, something we might compare to the way logicians use variables to expose the form of a logical argument. Thus, he can quickly state a rule that applies to an indefinite number of linguistic expressions. One can imagine doing the same thing in English. You might say, take any verb and call it V. Then V, followed by the ending ED, is the past tense of that verb. This rule would allow you to derive walked from walk or cooked from cook. And this is, in fact, pretty much how Panini's grammar works. He builds words out of basic roots with add-ons to show features like the case of a noun. The basic procedure will be familiar to you if you've ever studied a language with declinable nouns, such as Greek or Latin, which are, by the way, related to Sanskrit and have many of the same grammatical features. But even if you have studied Greek, Latin, or even better, both, you may find some of Panini's proposals surprising. We are usually taught that the basic components of a sentence are subject and predicate. Panini instead makes action the core notion of his grammar, that is why the eight chapters are supplemented with a list of all the verbal roots in Sanskrit. These are the core or basis of the whole language. What we would think of as the subject of a sentence is for him the agent of the action described in that sentence. Alongside the agent and the action, the other key part of a sentence is what he calls the patient of an action. And for those of you who know that declining a noun doesn't mean refusing to look something up in a dictionary, we'll mention that this patient is going to be put in the accusative case. In the sentence, Devadatta is cooking rice, the rice, we would call it the object of the verb, is the patient of the action of cooking. Then additional components of the sentence can be added to indicate the place where the action is happening, the instrument that is being used to perform it, and so on, as when we say, Devadatta is cooking rice in the pot with fire. As Panani explains, in Sanskrit one simply indicates the function of each noun using case endings. In English, by contrast, we tend to use prepositions, such as in and with. Insofar as they play different functions in a sentence, nouns become what Panani calls karakas, or contributory factors for some action. Patanjali puts it like this. A thing becomes a karaka with respect to the accomplishment of an action in which it participates. In our example, devadatta plays the role of the karaka of agent, which is primary and presupposed by all the other karakas since no action can be performed without an agent. Panani says that there are six such thematic case roles, agent, patient or recipient, instrument, donor, target, and locus. If one were to say, the leaf falls from the tree to the ground. The leaf is described as the agent because it functions independently. The tree is the donor, and the ground is the locus, or where the leaf falls. If one says, the king gives wealth to the Brahman by his own hand, then as well as the agent, the king, and the object given, wealth, we also have a recipient, the Brahman, and an instrument by which the act of giving takes place, the hand. The importance of action in the theory is indicated by the fact that the relationship we express with the preposition of, and expressed using the genitive case in these ancient languages, is not considered by Panini to denote a karaka. The reason is that of just denotes a relationship between two nouns, as in the Brahman's money, rather than a relationship between the verb and a contributory factor. Thus, Panani's karakas are not in fact the same as the grammatical cases of Greek or Latin. They're more like thematic roles that words can play. Of course, sentences can get much more complicated than the ones we've been considering. What if the verb is passive as when we say, the rice is being cooked? Or what if we have a word which doesn't take case endings, what grammarians call indeclinable words? 
What if we're using compound words? This is why Panani gives us so many rules. His guidelines tell you what to do in these and many other circumstances. In a feature of his grammar much commented upon by linguists, Panani sees that some rules constitute exceptions to other rules. There are the most general rules that cover all words, something that the grammarians compare to the rain that falls on all alike. Then sometimes a more specific rule will trump a general rule. Consider the fact that in English, a verb that already ends in e doesn't get ed added to show past tense, but only d, as with liked or shared, without which no one could describe what they've been doing on Facebook. To capture this, Panani even takes care to put the more general rules earlier in his list of sutras and specifies that a later entry will overrule an earlier entry with which it conflicts. So far, we've been talking about Panani and his followers as if they were simply describing the way that Sanskrit works, but that isn't the only way to think about grammar. Imagine that a friend says, do you want to come with? Or even worse, do you want to come with Janardan, Peter, and I? If you are a right-thinking person, you wouldn't simply add these to your list of the grammatical constructions used in English, even though your friend was speaking English, and even though these solecisms are actually quite frequent. Instead, you would correct your friend. You have to say come with me, not just come with, because the word with takes an object. The ancient Indian grammarians were also sticklers on such points, and thought of their rules as marking the difference between correct and incorrect language. Their mission was not merely descriptive, but prescriptive. Philosophers might say normative. In other words, they were not so much telling us how we talk, but how we ought to talk. Yet neither, of course, were they at liberty to decide arbitrarily what counts as correct Sanskrit. As Patanjali said, if you want pots, go to a potter, but if you want words, don't go to a grammarian, meaning that you should instead go find some actual language users and see how they form their sentences. What's called for then is a kind of compromise between the descriptive and normative conceptions of grammar. The Paninians do want to describe how people speak, but only when they speak correctly. For this reason, they defined a group of people they called the shishta, meaning the well-educated or learned. Grammar describes the speech of these people, not that of the riffraff on the street. The Paninians went so far as to say that such elite language users are distinguished by their upright moral character and not just their class or levels of education. Here's an interesting example of how this worked in practice. We've seen that Panani made agents and actions central to his analysis of language. But what about a sentence like, the pot cooks the rice? One option would be to rule this out as simply incorrect. It is Devadatta who is cooking the rice in the pot. But this is not what the grammarians say. Sanskrit users routinely referred to inanimate things as if they were agents and were happy to say that pots cook rice. We do the same, of course. If I told you to get the rice cooker out of the cupboard, you wouldn't think that I had Devadatta stashed in there, but an inanimate appliance. The grammarians were prepared to allow this usage, and laid down no rule forbidding us to treat a pot as having the karaka of agent. This led to a difference of opinion between the grammarians and the nayayikas, or logicians, who insisted that only a living thing can be dignified with the word agent. Panini's approach was more pragmatic and gave due weight to actual language use. It is perfectly correct to say either that Devadatta is cutting the tree or that the axe is cutting the tree, so it must be allowed that the axe is an agent even though we know that it is really the instrument of cutting. Here we've come to what may be the deepest philosophical question raised by the work of Panini and his successors. Does the study of grammar expose the structure of the underlying reality to which language refers? Or is it merely the study of linguistic usage, which may or may not tell us anything about the world? This is not a question Panini addresses himself. He restricts himself to devising the many rules needed to form sentences properly. But some scholars have thought that he presupposes something deeper below the surface grammar of sentences. This would be what philosophers call the semantic level, as opposed to the level of syntax. At the semantic level, we deal with meaning, rather than mere grammatical form. 
With this distinction in hand, we may suspect that, with the disagreement as to whether a pot can be an agent, the logicians and grammarians were talking past one another. It is proper to use the word pot to play the syntactic role of an agent, and this is what interested the grammarians. It's a different matter whether the word pot can actually mean an agent. But scholars don't agree about the importance of semantics in Paninian grammar. According to one reading, Panini asks us to look at the semantic role of a word to determine what syntactic role it should receive. For instance, you don't generate passive verbs in his system just by mechanically modifying an active verb form. Rather, you go back to square one and see that what is wanted in a given sentence is a passive meaning. Then you look at your grammatical rulebook and find out what the correct ending will be. Against this, it's been argued that Panini is really only interested in the construction of words and out of words, sentences, and that he has no interest in semantics at all. After all, grammatical syntax can be thought of as indifferent to meaning, as shown by the fact that you can form grammatically correct sentences that do not have any sensible meaning at all. The Indian grammarians give the wonderful example, There goes the son of a barren woman with his hair top bedecked with sky flower bathed with the milk of a tortoise, carrying a bow made of the horn of a rabbit. On the other hand, later grammarians definitely paid attention to the question of how words relate to meanings, if only in the process of staking out the proper boundaries of grammar as a science. Patanjali gave the example of a cow and asked whether the grammarian is interested in the actual animal with a tail and hooves. No, it is the word that is discussed in grammar. And the word is, he says, that which, when uttered, causes one to think of the cow, or the sound by which meaning is understood. This meaning is permanently linked to the word cow, and what is meant by it could either be cows in general, or some particular cow. Obviously, there are difficult philosophical issues lurking here. If the meaning of cow is a general one, then do we have to posit some universal nature of cowness for the word to latch onto? As we'll see in future episodes, European philosophers did not have a monopoly on the so-called problem of universals. That problem was obliquely raised through consideration of the function of words, and it is going to be tackled head-on by philosophers of the Nyaya school, who even use the same example of the cow and milk it for all it's worth. While we can't credit the grammarians with similarly elaborate philosophical reflections on this problem, they did forge a number of conceptual instruments that went straight into the Indian philosopher's toolbox. One that is closely connected to what we've just been discussing is the use-mention distinction. It's one thing to refer to the word cow, and another to actually use this word to refer to cows. It's the difference between a statement like, cow has three letters, or cow is a noun, and one like, I see a cow in the field. We nowadays mark this distinction using quotation marks for words that are being mentioned instead of used. The ancient Indian grammarians had no such orthographical device, but Panini has nonetheless been credited with making the distinction between use and mention. Nor does the contrast we've been drawing between grammarians and logicians mean that the grammarians were blind to logical issues. Patanjali formulated two of the most basic laws of reasoning, that double negation is equivalent to affirmation, so if something is not not a cow, then it is a cow, and that there is no third option between an assertion and its denial, the so-called law of the excluded middle. The fact that they were able to disagree on certain points, as with the question of the agency of pots, shows that Indian grammarians and logicians were at least operating in closely adjacent fields, even if they were plowing different furrows. All this gives the historian of philosophy good reason to take an interest in the Paninians. Beyond the philosophical relevance and interest of their own ideas, we can also see them as foreshadowing developments in philosophical schools yet to come. For instance, the activities of the Mimamsa school will be predicated on the idea that the sacred language of Sanskrit is fixed for all time. This is a reminder of the religious context that originally gave rise to Panini's project, and a reassertion of the value of the grammatical tradition, which will continue to go hand in hand with devotion to the rituals and culture of Brahmanism. But, 
As we've promised numerous times, the earliest phase of Indian thought was not marked by a monolithic agreement as to the value of that culture. Appropriately enough, we've sandwiched Panini between the Upanishads and the critics of Brahmanism. Next time, we'll begin to investigate the greatest of those critics, the legend, legacy, and ideas of the Buddha, here on the History of Philosophy in India.